Welcome back to the online Coastal Influence Seminar. Today we have Alex Wolfowski from Duke University, who will be talking to us about online experimentation for studying political polarization. After Alex, we will have a discussion by Edo Airoldi. Today, questions uh, will be handled by Emma, so now I'm switching over to her. Hi, everyone. Um, so nice to see you all in this capacity. Uh, so for questions, if you have any questions during the talk, please submit them using the Q&A. If you submit them through the chat, only the panelists can see them. So if you would like your question to be answered live by the speaker, uh, please submit them through the Q&A. Uh, the speaker, so Alex, will stop uh, at a few points during his presentation to answer questions. So feel free to submit them throughout the presentation. And uh, as soon as he can stop and answer them, he will. Right, so a few people will be also asked to ask their questions live. So once you submit your question, I might reach out to you and ask if you would be willing to ask your question live. Just keep in mind that if you ask your question live, this uh, meeting is being recorded and maybe posted online later on. Yeah, that's, that's all. Hope you enjoy the talk. All right. All right. Let me share my screen here. Um, should I start? <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming. I know that we're a year and a half into Zoom seminars, and so I appreciate you being here. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at the Polarization Lab at Duke. And uh, while I'll mention some people's names throughout the talk, I, I want to point out my co-directors, Chris Bale in sociology and Sunshine Hilligans in political science, who sort of make a lot of this work possible. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about political polarization and then sort of think about how does this, what, what implications does it have, uh, the type of studies we're interested in, what implications do they have for design of experiments? So uh, just to um, get our ducks in a row, I'll be thinking about the potential outcomes framework for causal inference. And what's important for me is sort of what happens here between points three and four. So I'm gonna have N people uh, who could be assigned to some kind of uh, treatments. And uh, throughout, I'll think about binary treatments, but we can generalize this to higher dimensional ones. And we have N potential treatments, right? Z1 through Zn. And the point is that each unit could have a potential outcome that's indexed by all of those treatment assignments. And so that means that each unit has two to the end potential outcomes because there could be two to the end potential universes. That makes causal inference really, really hard and potentially intractable. And so lots of standard assumptions have been introduced. Uh, the one that sort of is most important to us is the no interference assumption, the idea that only my treatment affects my outcome and nobody else's treatment affects my outcome. With a slight abusive notation, uh, we get to move from yi of z1 through zn to yi of zi. And so now we only have two potential outcomes. And so it's easy to define quantities of interest, for example, average treatment effects, which is the average over the differences between the potential outcome under treatment versus control. And even more importantly, with that assumption, it's somewhat simple to estimate these types of, um, I don't know if you can hear me. All right, sorry about that. So it's actually pretty simple to estimate these types of quantities by thinking about running a randomized experiment and randomizing half of your people into treatment, half of them into control, and looking at the differences in means. But networks make this hard, right? So in particular, they make this assumption um, impractical and unlikely to be the case. And so we need to design new experimental structures that allow us to better approximate the quantities we care about. So why is political polarization important? Well, turns out that Americans, and uh, I know that there are people here from all over the world, I assure you everywhere else as well, uh, everybody is extremely divided on pretty much everything. Um, in the US specifically, we know that partisan identification has become a substantially bigger predictor of social policy positions than what it used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago, where age and education were uh, very important for predicting this. This is potentially problematic because if uh, once we've chosen a side, 
we are now fully committed to that side, we have nowhere that we can actually have a conversation and maybe come to a better understanding that improves everybody's life. And so the question is whether or not this is because we are really subjecting ourselves to very selective exposures and we live in these echo chambers. Um, these echo chambers are, could be characterized by just only seeing what our side says and ignoring everything else. And where do we interact with content the most? Well, social media. And the question is whether or not social media is to blame uh, for creating these types of echo chambers. Maybe in the real world, we would have encountered lots of opposing opinions, but in this specific case, we're able just to X out of them on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, on Instagram, and so on. So the question is, how do you actually figure this out? How do you study whether or not uh, disrupting these echo chambers could be helpful? Are, they, are the echo chambers actually problematic and whether or not the echo chambers that are specifically on social media are problematic? So as you might imagine, uh, social media websites and companies are not fans of uh, uh, letting anybody manipulate their uh, content or uh, letting anyone manipulate their platform. And so it's unlikely that we can go to Twitter or Facebook and tell them, hey, guys, can we just turn off a couple of features uh, and see what happens? And so we need to figure out a way to engage with users or individuals, study participants, in a way that manipulates their social media exposure uh, while still maintaining the reality or sort of the realness of that exposure. The other thing is we need to figure out who we're actually learning about. While it's true that a lot of people are on Twitter and a lot of people are on Facebook, not everyone is on Twitter, not everyone's on Facebook. And so being very careful about identifying this population that we are actually talking about is going to be relevant for us. This is something that I want us to keep in mind also going down this line. How do we actually leverage the type of data that we collect to do more than just the first study? Because the study I'll describe is actually was very complicated to design, very complicated to run, and very expensive to run. So it would be nice if we are able to sort of learn more things or figure out better, cheaper ways of collecting these types of data. So our idea is to expose people to oppose to opposite views, to opposing views, and um, ask the question, what could possibly happen, right? What could go wrong? So in fact, we pre-registered quite a few hypotheses here. Uh, the first one is that everyone would get along. And there's some literature to suggest that sort of showing people what the other side really is all about is OK. Uh, however, this work was previously done on interpersonal contact, whereas we are taking this to the online realm. And so we could be a little bit worried that it won't translate directly. The flip side of this hypothesis is that everyone hates each other substantially more, right? So we uh, would make people more polarized, maybe due to backfire effects. So people are told that uh, their belief is incorrect. And so they just dig their heels in and believe that it is correct. Um, this was done in previous work on actually correcting factual inaccuracies, we're not going to be trying to correct any factual inaccuracies. We're, we're just going to sort of show people what the opposing side is talking about. And so this is a little bit of a different framework. And the last part uh, is that maybe some people would get stronger feelings than others. So um, this notion of asymmetry uh, exists in the political science literature, uh, sort of in trying to understand how different uh, uh, political streams change over time. And uh, in very small samples, there's work that suggests that conservatives value tradition, whereas liberals value change. And so maybe we could move one group in one direction, one group in the other direction. So I've, we have these three questions that we're trying to study, and I've alluded that we're going to expose people to opposing views. I haven't told you how we're going to do that. But first, let's sort of uh, think about this who are included, inclusion criteria people are. We need them to be Democrats and Republicans. We need them to visit Twitter because we're gonna do this on Twitter at least three times a week. And so normally I would be able to say something like with a show of hands, tell me who of you fit into one of these two categories, but we can't really do that. And so uh, I will tell you that lots of people use Twitter at least three times a week, but again, not everyone. The last inclusion criteria is that these people are willing to fill out surveys, and there's a lot of those, but many people fill out surveys online 
in a very anonymous fashion. And so by unmasking themselves, by sharing their Twitter handle, maybe they'll be embarrassed or not want to participate. So these are the types of people we're working with and the types of people we can make sort of statements about after we run this experiment. I'm going to tell you that we ended up doing some kind of block randomization on levels of party attachment and current interest in current events. That was just to make sure that those two uh, variables didn't play a role in the amount of treatment that each individual received. Um, but there's Twitter, so you should be asking, where's the network? Right? And so in reality here, how do we go about collecting these people? We could have just tried to advertise on Twitter. We could have picked a few seeds and tried to do a snowball sample of Twitter. One way or another, uh, this could have led to a formation of a network. And so then maybe a randomized experiment that just flipped a coin for each individual independently would not be appropriate. But what we ended up doing, because both of those versions of the universe seemed very complex, is we ended up going to a survey firm. And we asked them, hey, survey firm, you have a large panel of people. Why don't you go through our inclusion criteria, do this rejection sampling, and now you end up with a slightly smaller group of people, and pick a few of those at random for us. Now, there's no reason to believe that those people would be connected by a network. And so we just started there, and we got this. So in this cloud that you see here, you see a lot of dots. And those dots are people who are not connected to anybody else in our study on Twitter. But you should also, if you sort of uh, zoom in a little bit, which we'll do in a second, um, you'll see that there are people who are connected. Some are connected in dyads. But then there's these two giant components. And so the question is, what do you do with this? Because as I've alluded, and I've not shown yet, this could be problematic if you do sort of a very naive randomized experiment. So let's think about those two large components a little bit more critically. One is 56 nodes, one is 43 nodes. I believe the blue one is um, the uh, 43 node one. And in the blue one, it's fairly clear that there's a very central node right here. It's a, it's, it has almost all the people connected to it. Here, I think this node is probably the largest uh, node with the most connections, but this one is also pretty significant. So let's think about the blue one. Let's imagine that we're worried that maybe there's some kind of influencer behavior going on there for that central node. Maybe that person being um, treated will undoubtedly uh, bleed to all of their followers. But our goal is to learn an average treatment effect of some kind, right? We want to know what does exposing people to opposing views due to their overall movement, we don't really care about whether or not they get it. We, we don't want to know how it happens if they get exposed via their friends. We want to know the direct exposure does, does anything. So imagine that you have this universe. Uh, you have some baseline uh, effect for each individual, alpha i. The treatment effect that we're after is the number three. We're going to try to estimate three. Um, and we're going to do that by randomizing people into treatment and control. And then we're going to take the average of the outcome and the treated and subtract it from the average outcome and the controls. And this pesky part in red, this is our interference. It's a linear additive interference effect. AIJ is are you connected? And gamma J is the strength of that interference. So let's think about this uh, component, right? Imagine equal interference. So everybody gets interference at the level of one. Then this induces a bias on the order of 1.5% when estimating the number three using the naive estimator. If the interference effect is on the order of the actual treatment effect that we care about, then you get an almost 5% bias induced in the estimation. What if there's influencer interference? So everybody's interfering with each other at the level of two, but the influencer is twice, three times, or four times more influential. Well, this introduces substantially more bias. In fact, if everybody has a, an interference effect of uh, on the order of the direct effect we care about, uh, having uh, an influencer effect that's only four times as big uh, leads to 7% bias in this tiny small sample. What's even more frustrating when you're running these types of experiments is imagine nobody interferes with anybody 
other than the influencer, right? This is everybody else has zero interference, but the influencer gets an interference on the order of one third, two thirds, or the same size as uh, the direct effect. And that still can induce a bias in this estimation. Now, obviously, this is a simulation experiment, and so we don't have to really buy into this universe, but the real universe is probably way more complex, and so there we expect maybe even worse things to happen. Okay, so uh, this is not great, right, because we have two of these giant components that are kind of problematic. Now, if you remember the first picture of the network, there's about 1,300 or 1,250 people who are not connected to anyone else. So what we decided to do in this experiment to make it run smoothly is to eliminate these large components and to randomly choose individuals from the dyads so that we kept as many people as possible. Uh, we did this sort of for simplicity and for parsimony. And sort of the second half of the talk is really what could we have done uh, and what should we do in the future when we try to run these experiments and maybe we don't have access to a survey firm that will give us all of those individuals who are not connected to each other. So here's our experiment. We took our Republicans and we split them into treatment and control and the treated Republicans were exposed to a Twitter bot that was retweeting opposing people. And we tuned the bots to only look at individuals who are strongly identified in their political leaders and sort of uh, popular individuals who are strongly identified as liberal. For the Democrats, we did the opposite. We uh, retweeted at them uh, individuals who are strongly identified as conservative. And before and after this bot, we asked them uh, about their political identification, sort of these ideological standings that they have. And the question was whether or not by being exposed to this bot, we moved anyone uh, on the uh, ideological scales. Throughout, we measured compliance. Um, so we posted some cute pictures of animals that uh, Chris's daughter chose. And then on a weekly basis, we asked them, hey, if you remember, we posted a picture of a cute animal. Do you remember what it is? We had deleted it by that point. We also asked some substantive compliance questions about specific tweets that were posted. Uh, we checked, right, because we eliminated some people. Maybe this messed up with randomization. This is a national survey firm, and so they do a pretty good job at distributing uh, according to race and geography. And so here we're plotting our sample against the American Community Survey. And we see uh, that this is surprisingly well representative. Uh, I do wanna sort of make sure that we understand that this doesn't mean that this generalizes to non-Twitter users. This doesn't mean that this generalizes to people who are unwilling to participate, right? Uh, this is just saying that if we look at a Twitter user in Utah, then maybe these results actually make sense for them, uh, even if they did not participate in our study. And here are the results. Um, this is looking at a change in seven point ideological scale that's constructed sort of, there's a fairly standard set of scales that you can do. And at the top line, you have intent to treat effects. So uh, you see that uh, we didn't do a good job uh, we made Republicans more conservatives. We made Democrats maybe a little bit more liberal. As we go down the lines, this is just layers and layers of compliance, who is more compliant and more compliant and more compliant. And we see that in the sort of largest compliance group, uh, we see a strong effect for Republicans and maybe a slightly weaker effect for Democrats. So we sort of both have this uh, idea that things uh, became more polarized and that one of the groups did uh, feel stronger than others. There's lots of limitations to this study as I've sort of kept repeating and I'll keep repeating every time I talk about this is that we can't really go beyond Twitter users. We also didn't have any independence here because we wanted to make sure that we we're sort of targeting in the right direction uh, for individuals. And we didn't control for the actual tweets uh, that we were retweeting at people. We looked at them, none of them were egregious, but you could imagine, for example, somebody who has a Twitter feed who, that has absolutely no women, and suddenly we're retweeting at them from women. Maybe that's what made them unhappy, not that they were actually reading the content. We did check for some of these things, whether or not there's some extremism, demographic difference, and so on, and we did not find any noticeable differences. And so we do think this has important implication on sort of disrupting social media, that you can't just go about doing it willy-nilly. 
And so we have loads of future work that we've sort of been working on trying to understand how we can actually manipulate uh, more specific aspects of the interaction of individuals online uh, to try to get um, slightly better results. So this, this paper was published uh, in PNAS. These are all uh, great colleagues of mine. Um, uh, Chris is still at Duke. Everybody else, I believe, has graduated and or uh, taken uh, fancy jobs at other places. Um, so I'll pause here if there are any questions. So the, oh, we just got one question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it says, what type of rhetorical arguments were offered by their intervention bots? Ethos, logos, I assume the bots were sending content from anonymous versus balanced yeah. sources. So this is, this is a very good question. So um, the goal was to mimic um, as much of the social media experience that individuals might have uh, as possible. And uh, what we ended up doing is we actually picked a bunch of, uh, we, we looked at, let's say, all the senators and all of the uh, congresspeople, and we uh, made sure that their ideological leanings were fairly clear. Um, and so we have, um, I, I don't have the picture on here, but uh, we sort of constructed a conservatism to liberalism score for each individual. Uh, and the goal was, I think everybody had to have at least 10,000 followers or at least 50,000 followers in order to be included in our scored universe. And then we ended up uh, just choosing from there. And we picked random tweets from those people. Um, so we did not uh, go for anonymous sources. We did not, and, and the goal was really to evoke that something liberal might be happening or something conservative might be happening. Thanks, Alex. That's all the questions for now. Okay. So uh, since then, we've developed our own uh, sort of little social media incubator app that we've been bringing people into to have similar types of experiences as being exposed to the other side, but uh, maybe at a slightly uh, more direct message type of universe rather than just being blasted with 24 tweets. Um, and then uh, we've been thinking about sort of how much anonymity online could actually lead to uh, more or less polarization. And uh, I'm happy to report, though I'm not posting the pictures here, that uh, things are looking much better when people are interacting one-on-one -on -one, uh, than uh, when they are uh, being exposed to massive amounts of uh, opposing views. So while this is truly important for political polarization, uh, turns out there's lots of applications where there might be an underlying network and you need to do something about this underlying network. Uh, you might be studying disease prevalence or social development or some kind of online advertising, and you need to make sure that the effect that you are thinking you're estimating is in fact the effect that you're estimating. And so we need to extend the classical setting, sort of the random, classical randomization experiment, block randomization experiment, or any other types of experiment to these settings. And what we could run into are things like homophily, where similar individuals have uh, similar responses. And so if you didn't know that you have some kind of homophilous underlying network going on and you treated uh, everybody in a tiny homophilous group, you might just get the same answer. And so you might over or underestimate your treatment effect. Interference is what we've been talking about throughout and what I'll sort of showcase after this is the idea that maybe my friend's treatment affects the way that my outcome behaviors, right? Maybe I belong to a different universe or sort of my potential outcome is from a different universe if I have three treated friends versus if I have one treated friend. Entanglement uh, is something that we won't talk about today, but uh, it's the idea that you can treat, you can't treat just an individual, but you're still interested in an outcome on an individual level. So imagine that you're interested in the study of uh, closing triangles in a network because you have some social science theory or sociological theory that says that closing triangles makes groups stronger. And so if groups are stronger, maybe each individual's mental health will improve. And so if you're doing that, uh, you can't just treat one person, right? To close a triangle, you have to treat all the people of the triangle. And so 
uh, how that translates into actual estimation is, is an interesting and complicated problem. Unfortunately for us, again, we have to move to a potential outcomes notation where we deal with the full assignment factor, right? We have Z1 through Zn, and now there's again two to the n potential outcomes. Uh, we're going to simplify this a little bit uh, when we uh, move to the actual uh, derivation, but this is a much harder universe to work in. And the thing that I, I think is frequently, um, I, I don't want to say ignored, but missed when we're doing design of experiments in a classical setting is that the estimate that you care about should probably help drive the type of randomization you develop. The reason that we can sort of be a little bit cavalier with this in the setting with no interference is that, well, you usually are able to um, deal with uh, whatever sort of estimate you decide to want to study after the fact. But here we'll show that depending on the type of randomization you do, you can estimate some things and you maybe are unable to estimate other estimates. So for example, you might be interested in a total network effect. What happens if you treat everybody in a network versus treating nobody in a network? You could be interested in what we'll talk about, which is the direct effect. What does it mean that you assign treatment to one person? What does that treatment do to their potential outcome without regard for everybody else? The indirect effect is sort of the flip side of that. What happens when you treat my friends, but maybe you don't treat me? And the total sort of node effect is uh, something that you might care about if you care about herd immunity. So these are arguably very different estimates and they can help you sort of, they can help different groups study different things. Uh, and the randomization should probably adhere to what estimate you want. Here's a, a toy Facebook uh, from Wikipedia. Um, and they wanna know what happens if you change their ad algorithm, right? And one option is of course to flip the switch for everybody and say, hey, did it work? And that seems very dangerous from a shareholder perspective. And so you need to design some kind of randomization scheme that allows you to estimate this big picture quantity without endangering billions of dollars. So maybe you'll do some kind of clustering of the graph. You'll say each cluster looks like your true universe, like the true big graph. And then you'll treat one cluster and not treat another one and ask the question, what's the difference between their outcomes? This is exactly graph cluster randomization that Johan Uganda, Dean Eccles, Michael Carrer and company have worked on. Here's a different problem that we've been thinking about. Uh, imagine that you're trying to study the efficacy of isolation as a treatment for different uh, um, diseases like influenza-like illness. You're interested in sort of these quantities about the duration of illness or how much it spreads. And so it's, it's a very different experiment to think about um, if you just say, I'm gonna isolate everybody in one dorm versus isolating very specific people in different dorms. You could ask the question, what is the effect on just a randomly chosen individual versus what is the effect on the roommate of the person who is sick and you're isolating them with their roommate, right? So the, the type of question you're asking uh, has to really motivate how you do the randomization. So as, as scientists, we have a few things under our control. The estimate is what we actually want to learn, and that should be driven by the science, right? Do we care about the overall effect? Do we care about the direct effect? Do we care about herd immunity? The data collection scheme, I would argue, is under the control of the statistician, uh, or at least the person who is doing the uh, thinking about what will allow me to estimate something like the estimate that I care about. And so for us, that's going to be the object that we manipulate. We're going to choose a different randomization scheme that has different guarantees. The last object uh, is probably what is most often associated with uh, data, uh, data science and data analysis is manipulating the estimator. How are we going to summarize the data that we collect? And I would argue that this should be something that we fix ahead of time before we collected the data. Um, and instead of picking something that is overly complex, that is able to overfit to whatever data we collect in order to get us the answer that we want, I want it to be as simple as possible. And when we run randomized trials, the simplest thing you can do is look at the differences in means between the treated and the control individual. 
And the reason we want that is because I can tell that to anybody and I am unlikely to be misquoted, right? I'm not gonna open the New York Times and hear my name be associated with something that doesn't make any sense. So the ask demand is fixed, the estimator is fixed. And so we're gonna be working on de dealing with the randomization scheme. There's been a bunch of work and you know every time I sort of say there's been a bunch of work, there's even more work done. Uh, so this is by no means an exhaustive list of anything, uh, uh, but this has been a very important area in uh, causal inference. And uh, arguably the earliest work is work by Evan Sobel and uh, Hudgens and Halloran, where they think about two-stage randomizations of groups into treatment regimes and then randomizations within the groups. So uh, this allows us to decompose overall effects into direct effects and indirect effects. And this is really nice if you sort of believe in the type of universe where there is such a thing as no interference across certain groups of people. Now, if you don't believe in that, or if you believe that only approximately, then uh, you might not buy into this two-stage randomization universe. And so, for example, as I mentioned, to study this total network effect, graph cluster randomization does a really nice job because it turns out that if you think about this uh, small microcosms of your network, and you're willing to just suspend disbelief a little bit about just separating the interference between those clusters, then suddenly things get better and better. And there's actually a really nice uh, recent paper by uh, Yuganger, a co-author, uh, doing an improvement in graph cluster randomization that I think they call randomized graph cluster randomization that does even better. And you can derive really cool uh, theory for that. We're gonna be interested in the direct effect and we're gonna want to stick with the simplest estimator possible. Now, I told you that we're not gonna be able to do this for all two to the n potential outcomes. This is, it's just too complicated. And so we're gonna simplify our universe and say that we're, the interference is restricted to the neighborhood of a node. And this is a fairly common assumption in this literature sort of that has uh, grown over the last 10 years. Uh, it's actually possible to uh, re uh, reduce this uh, restriction a little bit. It just complicates the math substantially and doesn't really add, add to understanding here. So here's some notation. Uh, and this is joint work with Nitesh Pillai, uh, who's at Harvard and Ravi Jagadeesan while he was an undergrad at Harvard. And I think now Ravi might be graduated with his PhD. So we have a graph and for simplicity, this graph is gonna have two end nodes. And uh, the script N is going to be the neighborhood of a node and D is gonna be its degree. And there are three operational quantities that we have. There's the direct treatment effect. There's some kind of interference function that uh, when nobody is treated uh, or sort of none of the neighbors are treated, it returns zero. Otherwise it's free to do whatever it wants. And then there's might be some kind of vertex covariate effect. So you can think of that as just a baseline effect. So we take a set of treated units, and this is going to be a general linear model that motivates our work. I want to be very explicit that we do not fit this linear model, and we're just using it in order to showcase how an estimator behaves under this type of universe. What we care about is this T bar, the average over the two N units of these direct treatment effects. And what we care about as well is the super naive Neimannian estimator, right? The difference in the average outcomes for the treated people and the controlled people. Why does this uh, model help us? Well, in a really nice uh, paper by Dean Sussman and Ed Roldi, uh, they show that actually under sufficient assumptions for about interference, you can actually decompose the actual potential outcomes, which you see in the second half of the slide, uh, into uh, these different components. So you have some kind of baseline effect and a treatment, a direct treatment effect, and maybe some notion of interference effects. And under enough assumptions, you can sort of eliminate some of these parts and, and manipulate them. They do a really nice job of describing different estimators for this. Uh, we are sort of taking the flip version of this where we fix our estimator and try to decide on a randomization scheme. So here are operational quantities. We care about this average treatment effect. The Neimannian estimator is the difference in means. 
The ideal estimator is the one that you don't have access to, but that one knows about interference. And so it looks at, it eliminates the interference altogether and looks at XV plus TV for the treated and just XV for the controls. And the difference between these two things is in fact, the amount of interference that is experience, that, that is affecting your outcome, right? That, sorry, that is affecting your average treatment effect estimate. So if we can control C, if we can make the expectation of C small, if we can make the second moment of C small, then we're in business because then we have uh, our Neimannian estimators performing almost as well as our ideal estimate. There are lots of other estimators that are possible that I would argue are more complicated, have substantially problemat more problematic um, uh, behaviors. So you could have large variance uh, in an inverse propensity score weighted estimator. Uh, you can post stratify on degree, but maybe that's not a great idea because it turns out that that's the wrong thing to post stratify on. Uh, there could be lots of other options that are not simpler and they could lead to sort of poor behavior. And here's our design. This is a very simple design. This is why I needed two end nodes because I wanted to pair up all the nodes into any pairs. Uh, if you have an odd number of nodes, you'll have a dangling node and that's okay too, but you know, it's easier to think about this. So you paired up all of your nodes and you flip a coin inside each pair. One of them is gonna be treated. One of them is gonna be a control. We need an assumption about how much interference there can be. And so we make some kind of Lipschitz assumption, which essentially says that uh, by changing the uh, amount of interference that you experience from A to B, so A and B are uh, some functions of uh, your treated friends, you can't increase your the effect of interference by more than KB. Right? So we're just bounding there. And so it turns out lots of things that people have fit in practice fall into this KV Lipschitz universe. People have fit linear interference, fractional interference, and so on. And so uh, this is not uh, um, sort of a, a very strong assumption. And what's really cool is that the bias in of C, sort of the amount that C is different from zero, or the amount that our Neimannian estimator is different from the ideal estimator, is this, and it looks kind of simple. Um, let me just unpack it for you. What's really important here is that this summation is not over all of the edges in your graph. It's only over the edges that happen to be paired up. That's what's important. And so you can easily pick a partition or you might be able to pick a partition where nobody, no pair of nodes Share, has an edge between them, which in this case guarantees that this is going to be unbiased. The naive estimator is going to be unbiased. And so if bias is what you care about because you're running the same experiment over and over and over and over again, this, this is great for you. Um, this connects uh, to some work uh, by Vishesh Karva and Edo um, on thinking about what happens under different models. And so we show that if you sample uniformly over uh, these P, uh, then you get the same bias results as they do, which is K bar is the average amount of interference experienced by one person in a linear model. Okay. So uh, I'm, I can pause here for a second. Uh, I see one question in the Q&A uh, about the clustered, uh, Randomization. I, I could maybe I'll come back to that at the end because that's uh, sort of about the actual experiment that we ran before. Uh, are there any other questions about this? Seems okay. we don't have any other open questions, but feel free to submit questions to Q and A. Sounds good. All right. So what about variance? And it turns out that variance is really what. Uh, statisticians care about. And unfortunately, variance is really hard to control. And so we need to simplify our setting a little bit more. So before we just needed some kind of Lipschitz assumption. Now we're actually going to think about symmetric interference, where uh, the amount of interference experience is only a function of the number of treated friends and the number of untreated friends I have. And so it turns out, again, linear interference is part of that class. Fractional interference is part of that class. But Bounded amounts of interference are also part of that class, which is something that you expect when you study, for example, product adoption. 
right? You don't expect there to be an unlimited amount of interference. If enough of your friends bought an iPhone, you're buying an iPhone. So we need a little bit more notation and I'm cognizant of the time, so I don't wanna overwhelm us with notation. Uh, we need to think about these by degrees so that each node now has a treated degree and a controlled degree, how many treated friends and how many controlled friends they have. And uh, this uh, signed measure, all it does is it counts uh, for uh, any, any by degree, it counts how many treated units have that by degree and how many control units have that by degree. And so this is our assignment suggestion. So you want to balance out the number of treated friends who have K treated and K2 controlled friends and the number of control friends who have K treated friends and K2 control friends. So clearly in this simple example, you have a balance. Both of your treated nodes have one treated neighbor and one control neighbor, and both of your control nodes have one treated neighbor and one control neighbor. On the other hand, this is a bad assignment, right? Because both your treated first uh, individuals have untreated neighbors only, and both of your untreated individuals have only treated friends. It's going to be really hard to eliminate the effect of interference if you're looking at the second assignment. So we want to eliminate that second assignment if possible. Do these things exist? Well, I just showed you that they do. The longer answer is that they sometimes exist. So take a hexagon, so this is a 2K regular gram, and it turns out that uh, you cannot, none of the assignments are actually as good as you want them to be. They're all uh, going to be unbalanced. And so it turns out we, do, we should ask the question, do we need perfection? And the answer is no, we don't. So again, we study this object C, and we can rewrite it in terms of our signed measure and this interference function. And um, I'm gonna skip some of the details here, but essentially we need a metric on this space of by degrees and it captures uh, the differences in by degrees as a difference in degrees and the difference in the fraction of treated neighbors. So you can think about uh, if two by degrees are far apart, you're expecting sort of large amounts of diff large differences in the amount of interference to be experienced. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to bound the L2 norm of C. It's going to be bounded in terms of this function CP and something about one over the square root of the degree. So again, remember, we just have a partition. It's, we paired up the nodes. And the bound on the L2 norm of C is given by this complicated object. What's important here is that, again, this second part can be made smaller because this is just about the nodes that are connected to each other that happen to be uh, paired up. What's even more interesting is that the CP object is only about pairs of nodes that are paired up as well. And what's really great is that we can control this term. We can order all of our nodes according to their degree, pair them up this way, so now it's a different part paired, and it, then the CP is by definition bounded above by two. So the bias and the norm are actually bounded by these two objects. And it turns out that in a dense graph, as D min goes to infinity, uh, we're going to get that this um, mean squared error is going to go to zero, which is great. Um, I'm going to skip this example, but the idea here is that under a completely randomized design, even in this very simple setting, while we have that the completely randomized design gives us something that's unbiased, it's going to have infinite variance, whereas our partition is always biased, but it's zero variance because the C is a fixed number. All right, let me show you some uh, simulations where uh, things go well. Uh, and where things go slightly less good. So here, uh, interference is linear. And what's important to note here is that in this setting, um, CRD stratification is actually, this is a completely randomized design where you've stratified, is actually a, a fairly good estimate, right? And um, our uh, restricted randomization performs on par or uh, not substantially better than this. In a small world universe, uh, you sort of see similar behavior, but uh, in general, you see we get lower mean squared error uh, depending on uh, the setting. Sparse graphs, it's a little bit more math, but we can get uh, the bounds to go to zero. 
And if you have fancier interference rather than sort of a single interference function, uh, you can uh, update all of the math to deal with different types of interference. You can extend this to questions of homophily where you have some control over the amount of covariate information among similar individuals. So if you can control this for different types of people, then you can actually control the amount of the homophily affects your average treatment effect estimate. And you can, in that case, cluster randomized design inside of these different uh, homophily groups. So this is not controlling for that, but a stochastic block model is a homophilous universe. And imagine that this homophily plays a role in the outcome as well. Our approach still performs substantially better than completely randomized designs. And this is going back to this, this influencer setting. Here we have K stars. And so there's a lot of people in the middle of each of those stars is the influencer. And they have a lot of influence. And you see that even in this case, even though we are misspecified, we're still performing substantially better than the completely randomized design. So we have new designs for experimental networks. And uh, the claim here is that the design should really depend on the estimate of interest. And in this setting, we're able to control both the bias and the mean squared error of the naive estimate. Uh, the questions that I want to leave you with is sort of, can we port this to observational studies? Um, and uh, as I've already mentioned about the different uh, political polarization problems, we weren't able to reduce it in that setting, but a more personal approach can help with that potentially. I have one slide on generalizing this to interference effect, but we're sort of running low on time. And so I can keep that for later if uh, and do people want to talk about this, but thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Alex. I think we will now move on to the discussion. So, Edo, if you can. Yeah. All right. Well, we have. Uh, thank you, Alex, for your presentation. Uh, next up, we have uh, the discussion by Edo Iroldi. Uh, assuming we have time, Alex, you will have a couple minutes in the end, a few minutes in the end, to respond to uh, Edo's discussion. Maybe we'll have some time for Q and A. Edo. Take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. And nice, Alex, seeing you and great talk uh, as usual. So I'm going to discuss the role of model misspecification in the design of experiments, you know, with regard to some of the work I did. And I'll have some questions for Alex at the end. And I have more slides, I should say, than I plan to talk through. but since the slides get posted, I think it'll be nice context for everyone who is going to watch the recording. So uh, some acknowledgments, collaborators, former and current Don Rubin, Vishesh Karva, uh, Guillaume Bass, and Jean Pujabadi, and three references here. Uh, most of the content of this discussion will be uh, you know, about the first reference model assisted design. So let's jump in. <clears throat> and for those of <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who don't know me, um, this thread of my work came out of uh, collaboration with industry, um, with Google mostly. That's where the motivating questions coming from. And then some of this technology has been used, notably at LinkedIn and now at Amazon uh, to do experimentation with capacity constraints. So here's the motivating question: We want to run an A/B test or randomize experiments. We have two options two auctions to you know add word auctions with reserve prices and we want to estimate lift on total revenues there's many more metrics like alex said in this sort of industrial modern context where we run experiment there's a lot of issues uh strategic behavior the units are not iid or even you know uh, there's not even non-ignorable non-compliance right uh, this is a dynamic environment, this is a heterogeneous treatment effects, and there's dependent outcomes, for instance, like in Alex's talk through the network. We all have models predictive of user behavior, or advertiser behavior, a statistical model for an outcome. And the question is, how do we leverage a model <clears throat> in designing this test or in, in setting up the randomization exactly and what can go wrong? And so these are two, you know, approaches well trust in the model model based so-called design of experiment is bad why well if the model is correct you get 
an unbiased estimate, then you're very confident in, in this estimate. If the model fails, which is typically the situation we're in, we don't know what the bias is. We can't control it. We're still overconfident in this, in this bad estimate. If you ignore the model, completely randomized design, it's a straw man here, right? You get an unbiased estimate under some condition and you know, relatively higher variance because you're ignoring a lot of information. For instance, a network that you have access to or covariate you have access to or a survey you have access to pre-randomization. And I'll say I'm biased under some condition and this is sort of the caveat because the theory is ignoring all of these other complications that we have models to control for. So that's not really viable either. And so our take in, uh, in designing experiments, you know, leveraging models, but not catastrophically failing if the model fails, is to use a model-free estimator, a very simple estimator, same as in Alex's talk, but impose model-dependent uh, constraints on the randomization. And here, what happens is that if the model is correct, again, no bias, low variance, that's not reality. But if the model fails, we still get an unbiased estimate because of some symmetry properties of the randomization and of the restricted randomizations. And you know the variance may increase, but that's exactly what you want. You always want to be having an unbiased estimate if possible. And then you know, to the extent to which the model fails will, will blow up your variance and, and you know, that'll be a happy situation for me. So I'm going to skip some of this. Complications arising from a social network. There's a paper with Vishesh Karva that Ali uh, kindly mentioned as well, where we do a lot of calculations uh, on, well, what would happen if you have, you know, a certain complication, let's say interference with a certain form, additive, fractional interference, total interference, and you use, you know, Horowitz Thompson or naive difference in means estimator, what's the price you're going to pay in terms of bias and variance? So if you're running this kind of experiment and you're interested in direct effect or network effect, maybe this is a good reference for later. So now I'm just going to jump in, you know, into model assisted design of experiment. So the same as in Alex talk, I, and you know, we, I guess, believe that the estimator is often time fixed and especially in industry, the estimator lives inside the UI is something you can't really touch. The estimate of interest obviously is something that changes from problem to problem. Uh, and you have the most leeway, at least in the industrial setting, to, to play with the randomization. So you can come up with clever randomizations. And so here the strategy is to still posit a simple non-trivial model for the outcomes. Alex, Alex had a simple inner model here. We may have a slightly more complicated model and use the model to get the conditional MSC for your estimator, which is model independent, right? Conditional on a, an assignment vector, bold Z. <clears throat> and then inspect this conditional MSC and learn how you could minimize variance and bias. And so how you could impose constraints on the randomization. And I'll just give you a simple example here. So I have outcome, outcomes YI, there's no interference here, but there's a network and the outcomes are correlated through the network. So XI would be the budget of an advertiser. And then the outcome, sorry, the um, ad spend, the revenue spent by this advertiser under the control auction would be a function of the total budget of the competitors. And so that's how the, the outcome are correlated. And if you are in the experimental auction, you pay beta extra dollars, and that's what we want to estimate. And the naive estimator is just the difference in means estimator. Now, if you use this model to compute the conditional MSC of beta, conditional on an assignment vector, you get a formula. And by inspection, for instance, you can see, well, this is the bias square term. There's a bunch of variance term. Well, the bias is introduced by, if you inspect, the number of competitors for the advertiser in control being different than the average number of competitors from the adver for the advertiser and the treatment. So this suggests a simple constraint in, in, on a randomization scheme, which we call unbiased, where, oh, you just have to make sure that the advertiser in treatment and in control have the same average number of competitors, even that the budget is symmetric across the groups. And then, you know, you have the um, completely randomized design. We'll have a balanced randomization in which just the number of advertisers and treatment is the same in control. And you can 
sort of come up and think about sort of and define more and more constrained randomization spaces, you know, by controlling and inspecting all the other terms. And if you read this paper, you'll see how that is sort of useful and optimal and practical. But I don't want to talk about that. I just want to do one quick jump into robustness to misspecification in design of experiment. And so the interesting aspect of model assisted design is not so much, you know, the use of a model to come up with constraints with respect to the, um, on the randomization in the space of possible assignments is this design unbiasedness, meaning this difference in, in mean estimator of beta is unbiased with respect to a randomization, so a, a distribution over the allocation vectors, right? If the expected value with respect to the randomization is, you know, of the difference is zero. And, and the kicker here is that for the difference in means estimator with respect to all these tiered constrained randomization schemes, we get design unbiasedness. And, and this is, you know, we understand in this paper, we flesh out where this unbiasedness is coming from. There's two notions of symmetries. And if you have a new problem and a new estimate slash estimator and a new set of constraints that come up with your model, the new, you know, new theorems can be derived, but the intuition here is that, well, the estimator in our case was symmetric with respect to this flipping operation where you flip from Z, a bunch of people in treatment and in control to one minus Z, where you get everyone in treatment and you put in control and if you are in control, you put in treatment. And so the symmetry here is that with respect to this flipping operation, well, the sign, you know, the amount of bias remains unchanged, only the sign changes. So that suggests that if I had Z as an allocation vector in my constraint space and one minus Z in my allocation, you know, as an allocation vector in my constraint space, the bias will cancel out. And so now the second aspect, the second notion of symmetry is that not only the estimator has to be symmetric with respect to this flipping operation, the constraints also. Because if the constraints are you know, non-symmetric, you know, Z may be in the constraint space, one minus Z may not be in the constraint space. And so if you think about this one constraint that for the sake of time we discuss, which is the average degree or the average number of competitors being the same in treatment and control, well, if the average degree, average number of competitors is five here and five here, and you flip everyone from treatment to control and vice versa, the average number of competitors doesn't change. So in that sense, the constraint itself is symmetric. And so if you have these two notions of symmetry, essentially you get design and biasness. <clears throat> and so now, you know, in the interest of time, maybe trying to leave a few minutes for, for Alex to respond. So with the advantages of this strategy is that the conditional MSC is simple to compute. The implied notion of by, by, um, balance, balancing on the average degree are easy to implement. The methodology yields analytical properties for finite n, and we haven't talked about all of them, but we talked about the design and biasness. There's more in the paper. And the theoretical guarantees hold even if the model fails, because the proof of design and biasness only depends on symmetry and does not depend on the model. So questions for Alex and co-authors. Well, the, for the first part, I guess a lot of people in industry do this AA test or you know, randomization test, pre-randomization test, re-randomization, it depends, you know, I don't know, people in different, uh, you know, sciences talk about them in different ways, but essentially you're trying to, after you're committing to a randomization, before executing the randomization, you can check on pre-experimental data whether there was a difference. And so that, you know, uh, sort of tell you about unplanned or unknown confounding, you're blocking, but maybe you didn't block on the right factor. And so this would surface that. Other question would be, well, you have some nice bounds. There are symptotically, um, you know, the, the randomization strategy you propose gets uh, in a symptotically unbiased estimate. What about the sharpness of these bounds for finite n? And in particular, if I have a special graph like a block model or a small world which you um, run some simulations on, do you have any special insights for special graph? And then, you know, the one, you know, concern question, which I haven't made my mind up is your ideal estimator, 
that the bounds depend on because you know it tells you about this uh, xi, which is the difference between the estimate based on your simple estimator and the estimate based on your um, optimal or ideal estimator is model based. And so the model is baked into the bounds and the bounds are used to come up with the randomization. So the question would be what happens under misspecification? And other question would be how easy it is to extend this strategy, which I think is actually quite cool and, and original to other estimates if anyone wanted to, to try and do that. So thanks very much. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Edo. Uh, Alex, would you like to respond in a few mi minutes? Sure. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Edo, for the great discussion. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have some thoughts. Uh, so the pre-randomization or the AA testing, uh, I mean, in, in our universe of running experiments, that's, we definitely check for balance. Um, this, this brings to up sort of an interesting question of where do you get your population? Um, our balance is usually pretty good, and uh, we uh, we get our population from this survey firm, and they they tell us it's a random sample, so that's what we do. Um, as for the so the asymptotic sharpness, sorry, the the sharpness of the balance for finite n is a very interesting question, and uh, we we did not really explore it in the paper. Uh, the the idea was because the bounds for let's say mean squared error or for um, for the for the L two or the L one norm are uh, as a function of the randomization scheme. What all we're telling you is that if you choose a randomization scheme like ours, you're going to make that bounce smaller than if you chose a larger randomization scheme. Right? That's what's going to happen. And uh, you sort of take it or leave it. Uh, the asymptotics tell us that this should work well in practice uh, as your graph gets larger and larger. And the simulations across sort of lots of different graph types suggest that, because uh, the simulations just plot the actual MC, not the bound, uh, suggest that we are in fact performing better. Um, but it, I think it's a very interesting and uh, hard problem to uh, look into. So we, we, that is something that we did definitely consider. Uh, for your last point about how um, the model is baked into the bounds and, and sort of the whole procedure, I would argue that the assumption of additivity is baked into this process, but the model itself is irrelevant, right? So it depends on what you, part of it you call the model. Um, yeah. So uh, yes, we, we cannot currently avoid this problem that we need to make some statements about how the potential outcomes behave in relation to the direct effect and in relation to the uh, indirect effect. And so we need to decompose the potential outcomes. And in fact, for justification, we are using your paper with Dan to suggest that if you make the assumption of symmetric and additive interference, then you are allowed yeah. to think about this type of model. And so um, I would claim that the ideal estimator is not um, model-based, it is in fact just Additivity based. Additivity, but yeah, no, in the paper, exactly that. All right. And so uh, it's de definitely true that you could end up with massive misspecification. That was the point of the influencer simulation, which does not fit into this setting because it is not symmetric and uh, it's a little bit multiplicative, actually. Mm. Um, yeah. And the last one was about other estimates, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah definitely. So um, I know that we're a little bit over time i can let me show just the one slide then um, right so uh the goal here is to estimate some kind of quantity about indirect effects and so the trick is to play the same game but now we want to eliminate the direct effect and so maybe we're interested in the effect of at least one treated neighbor now again here you have to be very careful when defining your estimate because you can't say, oh, I want to learn about interference and then do whatever, and then try to figure out what interference means. So we pre-specify at least one treated neighbor versus no treated neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so we might be interested in these types of simple estimators. So this is just the average effect for those who have that versus those who don't. So we've defined a design, uh, an exposure, right? Mm 
And so now we can play the same game. And what's really cool, and this is work with Sid Sarkar, who is now a PhD student at CMU, is that it turns out that lots of these approaches uh, turn out to be solutions to optimization problems. And uh, this is ongoing work, but uh, we're very hopeful that we can actually write this down where this optimization problem can be generated automatically just based on specifying the S demand of the estimator. But is it the same strategy though? You come up with an ideal estimator, you come up with the you know, DVD, uh, you bound it, or is it different? Strategy? No, this is a little bit different, but it's it's a fair, it's, it's in the same theme. The goal here, so if you end up doing this optimization uh, and you, you take one of its solutions, uh, you're guaranteed that you're able to estimate the quantity you care about, which is not always the case with interference estimation. And you're guaranteed that when you treat as many people as you were treating in that specific example, you are doing as well as you could. Um, but it's not, the notion of an ideal estimator is not as obvious. And so that is something that we're thinking about. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Definitely. Thank you, uh, Alex, for a very interesting talk, a very interesting application, and thank you, Ed, for uh, the discussion. Um, all right, next week, um, we'll be having uh, two speakers. We'll have uh, Fiametta Manchetti from the University of Florence and Armin Tab from ETH. I hope I pronounced my name correctly. Um, we hope uh, to see you, see you there. Enjoy your week. Thank you. Thank you all.